Thank you very much indeed, uh, Saul and the committee, for asking me to come today. And actually, I'm feeling sort of so humbled about your amazing efforts that I feel like mine is going to pale into, into insignificance. But I'm sort of consoling myself that I'm actually trying to do something slightly different. Um, so I'd like to share with you my experiences of running a, a postgraduate one-year distance learning blended e-learning diploma that's based primarily for GPs or for other individuals who are practicing dermatology who want to improve their knowledge base. So it's a slightly different uh, uh, type of remit that we've, we've heard about from Amanda. So, so der dermatology in the UK, as I'm sure we are all aware, is in a complete state of crisis. We've got a supply-demand mismatch that's on a massive scale. And as we've heard from previous speakers, this is due to both small numbers of consultants, fewer amount of doctors being trained, massive increases in the number of patients being referred by their GPs, rising skin cancer, rising patients' expectations. We all know the causes for this. And in conjunction with this, we've got a problem that the GPs, if they're lucky, will have two weeks of undergraduate level in dermatology in this country. If they're lucky, in some areas they don't actually get any dermatology and there's very little provision for them. So, so we've got a problem that our workforce really know no skin at all, and it can be sometimes up to 25% of their, their daily workload. So this is a, is a massive problem. So I think this is a rather nice analogy to thinking about teaching and thinking about service models of delivering dermatology <laughs> care, actually, that you know, we can think about just changing our service model to give the man a fish, but actually if we teach him how to fish we've got a lifelong sort of sustainable way of delivering and providing health care. And that's, that's very much the sort of flavour of what we're trying to do in the diploma. So the seeds of training uh, our GPs at postgraduate level were actually started by my colleagues, Professor Irene Lee and Dr Michael Claver, both dermatologists from London. And they started this back in 2001 with the idea of a distance learning course. This was long before e-medicine was really happening at all. And in fact, when I took over in, in uh, 2003-04, our, all our students, and we had about 10 to 12 of them, used to receive weekly packages like this, it's rather cute, on, the, on their Habitat doormats. We just photocopied articles from the press, uh, journals, uh, and uh, a small sort of little mini chapter that was written by various colleagues, and that would be the, the diploma course. And uh, it's a very different picture now. So we've now developed a, an, an overseas component of this course as well as in the UK, and uh, it takes part over one year. Most of our education is on an e-learning platform, which we'll have a look at um, very shortly. But it's very much a blended learning, and by that I mean we've got the written word, we've got the spoken word, we've got the video word. So we're very much trying to encompass the styles of different learning styles that people like when they're learning. Um, and, and this is something that I've been developing very much over the last few years. In addition, for the UK students, we have in-person teaching um, here in small group teaching in, in, in the outpatient clinics, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. It's a modular course which is in line with the university structures that are, that are, are, are popular at the moment. And the evaluation happens by threefold, really. We have weekly MCQs, which are done online. There's a written exam, um, which is either done in various centres internationally or in London in the UK, and they have a, an essay uh, to write. So that's really what's hap been happening to our student numbers uh, since uh, I took over this course. So it's, uh, it's, it's ra really rapidly taken off, and we've growth year on year. And this is really where our students are, are all distributed globally. So, so far sounds all so good, but actually it's been not without its challenges, and, and I'm kind of going to, enjoy, going to enjoy sharing some of these with you, because actually it's part of the fun of, of working in e-learning, really. Um, we've heard a little bit about some of these sort of regulatory issues already from, from Amanda, and, and, and fitting in with the university rules, regs, the constant worry about updating and marketing things is not something I'm going to spend much time on. Uh, my colleagues and friends who knew me well couldn't believe I took this job on because I could scarcely send an email when I started doing it. And they said, what are you doing e-learning, Vicky? You know, you, you really can't turn the computer on. So, so being IT savvy would have been great, but I've learned an enormous amount and fortunately have the uh, colleagues who, who are e-learning technologists at my disposal, which is just as well. But the thing that I want to talk to you about is that these things, really, which is setting your curriculum actually making teaching tools that you're going to use online and, and what works and what doesn't. And, and also the, the issue about student engagement, which is really important. It's, it's very easy to engage with a group of people when they're here in front of you, but when they're in Hong Kong or you know, elsewhere in the UK, uh, at the end of the computer, that's not always so easy. And there's a few things that I've done which I think uh, have helped with that process. 
So the curriculum, so this is something we got really wrong in the beginning, actually. And uh, what we did was we sort of mapped the curriculum to the rookbook, because we as dermatologists worship the rookbook, and we thought, well, everything that's in the rookbook, they need to know. This was a massive mistake, because in the old rookbook, it used to start with genodermatosis. <laughs> And I don't know about you, but I find that a very challenging subject. So, so we started off sending them in sort of, you know, apical hydrokeratotic stuff, and, and within about three weeks, half of them had given up. So that was, that was a complete disaster. So, so we had to completely rethink this, and, and actually the real sort of lesson here was thinking about, you know, who was your target audience? And it sounds very obvious, but actually it's interesting with you, Amanda, that your target audience is everybody. And, and our target audience is a much smaller one, but it's, it's not us as dermatologists, it's people working in primary care. So really need to just refocus that. And, and even though I spent a bit of time in primary care, I hadn't done it for ages. So we needed to liaise closely with colleagues about what they actually wanted. And we've now sort of mapped our, curri our curriculum really very much to the sort of BAD one. And, and that seems to work, work much better. But, but you know, what, what, what turns us on doesn't necessarily turn them on. So, so that's quite important. So we've used a, an online learning platform called Moodle, which this is a sort of screenshot of what it looks like. And so people who sign them up will have the password protected um, access to, to this website. It's, it's okay. I mean, I, I've, it's what I've been given to use. I, would I go out and choose it if I was doing it myself? Probably not. I find it a bit clunky. It's not very sexy. It's a bit dull. But, but it, it, it delivers the goods. And, and we've, we've sort of set this up a bit by having a Twitter feed going on there, and I've got various videos on it and things, just to, to liven it up a bit. But I personally find it a bit clunky, but it, it's, it's cheap, and, it, and it's what we've been given by the university. So, so this is Moodle. And, and what they get each week, so, so really the, the weekly, the, the core of the re weekly work is like a little mini sort of tech, written text chapter, if you like, and that's again been written by a number of colleagues. I've, I've added lots of little clinical tips in there, which as a bullet point, which I think is quite fun. So, you know, in the, in the eczema chapter, we might have a clinical tip of applying emollients to damp skin, for example, or something like that, which is kind of information that you've got from your clinical practice that's relevant for them out in the community. Um, and, and that's something that we've had good feedback from. We have supplementary reading, which is links to websites, links to patient information, links to etc. each week. And then the thing that I've been focusing on that we'll talk about a bit later is, is using multimedia um, for each week. We do a case of the week each week, which is changes often if things that we've seen in fun things we've seen in clinic um, that we just put on, and they, they, they'll talk to themselves about that, and then we'll give them an answer and a sort of differential discussion the following week. Um, webinars are something we've introduced for the overseas students to replace the in-person teaching, and again, we'll talk about that in, in, in a bit of detail. And they have a weekly NCQ. The UK lot get these clinical teaching days six times a year, which are sort of more didactic like this and with patients in the afternoon. Um, and, and we sort of thought, well, are we doing this right? Is, are we giving them what they want? So, so I've sort of validated this mix, this blend, if you like, with questioning the last cohort. And the, they're pretty happy that we've got the balance kind of more or less right. So I'll just sort of show you very quickly, this is the sort of thing when they log on that they see. And it, this is all looks fairly standard. And as Amanda was saying, we, we formatted it all. So it looks the same each week. And that's also, trust me, quite hard work when you inherit a lot of material from other people. Um, we've had to for format that so it's uniform. And MCQ is pretty standard. You, you'll have all seen this, this type of thing online. And they'll get the results from that and feedback for their performance sort of there and then. And that goes towards their final course grade. So, so student engagement, really, I think is a really important thing with e-learning. As I say, it's, it's, it's difficult to, to, to make people feel that they belong to the course. And, and, and uh, this is an easy platform to teach, but an e-learning is not always easy. So there's a couple of things that we've introduced. So we, we try and encourage them to upload a personal photo of themselves as part of their student profile so that they know who each other is, they feel a bit more connected. And we've also got an online student chat room. We use, they use it a fair amount. I think in an ideal world, I'd like to have a little bit more manpower to have some consultant input, because they're using it very much for peer-to-peer -peer teaching, which is very trendy at the moment, but in my books needs some, a grown-up to manage that. And we don't really have the resources to do that. So I think moving forward, that would be something we could do better. Um, I, I got turned on to the whole idea of the video, really, with, with Lady Di, actually, believe it or not. When Lady Di died, you know, in whenever it was, 1998, that the whole world went into mourning, and that was a very odd thing to do, because you think, well, look, why are you doing this? You know, never, most, most people have never met this woman, and, and the fact was that you felt you knew her because you'd seen her every day on the telly. 
And, and I felt, well, that we can learn something about this but from our, our, our students, because if they feel that they know us, because they see us a lot online, then they feel like they're engaged, they're part of the learning group, and, and that was really what triggered me to think that we need to be engaging with people with online videos. And so we'll, we'll have a look at some of those in a minute. Webinars, again, a great way of engaging, um, it, and, and, and it's a fun way of educating, if, if you like that way of service delivery, but it's a good way to engage with the students. We give very detailed feedback on our essays, and more recently we've started using um, Twitter, I don't really use it for anything other than dissipating CPD type information. So I'll tweet a headline from the Ajad or something like that. We're not really using it as a, as a sort of social chat type thing. We haven't got the manpower to man that. So I'm just going to show you some examples uh, quickly of some of the things that we've been doing. And so, so the weekly audios. Um, these have been great fun. The, the students love these, actually. Sometimes I think that maybe they might like the videos more, but probably because I like doing the videos more, but they actually really like these because they can listen to them in the car when they're going to visit patients and stuff like that. And so the feedback on these has been good. They're, they're relatively cheap to make, really. I mean, you just you do need a soundproof room, and this might sound really obvious, but we've actually started this run, this course, really on a complete shoestring. We never had a dedicated recording studio. We didn't really have very much posh kit. So it's actually sometimes quite difficult to find a space that's quiet and away from things to, to get this kind of stuff done. Um, so, so that's important. It's really important to try and do it all on one take, if you can, otherwise you're stuck with a horrendous job of editing, which is just really, really boring. So, so we try, whenever possible, to do things on one take. And from my experience, the first take's really always the best anyway. So, so just try and get it done once. And, and again, Amanda wrote a new business about language. It's really important to keep the language sort of user-friendly and straightforward, especially when you've got international students. So I've just, I've just grabbed a bit of a clip, slightly at random, from, from the introduction. So the first week for us now, instead of going into genodermatosis, we've got a little bit of chat about just recognising skin disease and things, and it's quite casual. But, but uh, I, I just chose this because I, it gives you an idea of a bit of the sort of banter that I, I like in the course, which is either you I'm going to be talking to Dr. Hubbard about all of these different facets during the course of the next discussion. First of all, I think, I think you'd agree there are some sort of general principles that we need to bear in mind when we're starting to treat our patients. Well, I completely agree, Dr. Olive. I mean, I say the first one, this may sound quite obvious, but try to make a diagnosis. <laughs> sometimes easier <laughs> said than done, but absolutely, don't treat blind, no. No, and I, th I think sometimes it can be tempting that if you haven't made a diagnosis to try and treat, but perhaps a, a, of course, a word of caution, and if you imagine the patient who has a solitary scaly patch on the leg, mm. and one might want to give a topical steroid to see if it treats it, and then four weeks later they come back and that patch has increased in size, and then you suddenly realise that in fact you were dealing with a patch of tinea. Right. None of us have been there, of course, so, uh, so that's all fine. But, so so that's, it's really it's a dialogue between them, and the one on photodermatosis will have one of us chatting to uh, someone like Jane McGregor, for example, about sunscreens and what's important in them and what do they really mean. So, so those, are, those are, I think they're really, they're fun, they're a bit punchy, and they're, they're, they're just a sort of casual chat, but they're very informative. They're usually about 10, 15 minutes long. So the videos... Um, the educationalists all like us to have learning aims and objectives, which I'm afraid, frankly, isn't really my scene, but because this all has to be badged by the university, we have to have learning aims and objectives. So I decided we'd turn them all into videos because it's a bit more fun. And, and again, they've really enjoyed that, and, uh, uh, and I've enjoyed making them. It's fun as the director to have a bit more creative drive in this. I'll just show you a brief one example of this. Um, and it engages the students. A bit more hassle, you've got to find a studio, you've got to have the right kit. It's slightly more expensive. Um, and again, get it right first time because editing it is, trust me, a complete pain. The other thing that I got wrong in this sometimes is make sure that you do a screenshot first. And I'll, the next video I'm going to show you is one where I didn't do a screenshot because I used a really experienced team and I thought, oh, they'll know. Big mistake, huge. They didn't know. And, and, uh, and that, that was a mistake that I've learned. So, so this is just a sort of typical thing that we'll have as, as an introduction. This week, we're going to be thinking about psoriasis. Psoriasis can be an absolutely devastating disease and increasingly we're beginning to realise as both dermatologists and general physicians that it certainly is more than just skin deep. Psoriasis obviously and most visibly affects the skin but as we know it can also be affected with arthritis and arthropathy and increasingly we're beginning to see it as really more of a metabolic syndrome 
with increased risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Okay, thanks. So, so that's just the sort of introduction we've done, and that usually lasts about five minutes. It just gets them on board. Um, this is one of those ones where I should have done a screenshot because that's really bad, white on white, it doesn't look good. I was really upset about it, um, but there you go. You know, this kind of matters. It really matters that it's good. So th that's a learning curve that I got wrong. This is a video, I'll just show you quickly because we had such a laugh doing this video. I mean, it was great fun. And there isn't much out there about explaining histopath. And the GPs on one level don't need to know that much, but they kept coming back saying, and oh, what does a psoriasiform reaction mean? And I thought, oh, for God's sake, well, let's just do some videos on it. So, so Manu and I did these, and, and I then thought, I really wished I had a digital whiteboard, because it would look really smart, you know, digital whiteboard. Of course, we've got no money for that. But, I mean, I, these videos have been so popular. I just, I'll just show you, show you this. And, and we did a whole load of them on all the reaction patterns. So and we've talked a little bit about a spongiotic pattern yes. in, its, in its sort of the hallmark of acute eczema, really. Yeah. Tell us about psoriasis a little bit. So psoriasis is uh, another classic um, histological pattern. Right. And psoriasiform okay. means thickening of the epidermis, again, but also with characteristic features. So you get sort of a confluent parakeratosis. What, um, what do we mean by parakeratosis? So this is a phrase that you might see on some histopath reports. Shall yeah. I, shall I just, can I just take the liberty of drawing my little normal epidermis and normal skin again? Yes. We sort of omitted from the first lecture, first yes, pattern yes. about the keratin layer. So we have the epidermis and we have the keratin. So, so that's just an example. So we've got loads of those on all of them. And we just, we did them all on one take, got the whole lot done in an hour. And it was fantastic. And I looked at them and I thought, well, I'm really looking forward to this. And they just didn't look very good because of that screenshot. But they, they're great. They're a great thing. And then this is the other type of thing. There's a lot of these just patient she's cases she's demonstrating the clinical side. Affecting both lower legs. And you can just see here the hint of some scale around the edge. On closer inspection really of the feet, camera we can see she has got you know, dystrophic not, toenails the where the whole of the nail has been destroyed by psoriasis. Okay, so, so that's just a little example of what we've done to sort of, you know, jazz things up a bit with the videos. Just briefly on webinars, we use Adobe Connect. It rarely goes wrong, actually. The technology is dead easy, and that works. And, and again, it's cheap, and it's easy to deliver to a wide audience. The only trouble with these webinars, two things I'd say really, number one is that the doctor who's giving them, or the teacher, really needs to be happy in that medium. It's very much like talking to a brick wall because you've got no feedback at all. And, and some people who I've invited to come and do webinars have said, never again, it's not my, my platform, because you don't really feel like you're engaging with, with, the, with the learning. The other thing that happens is that, the, like everything in life, the extroverts take <coughs> over and dominate the chat room. And then so you get some people who don't really take part in that, and that can sometimes mean that you have to be careful about how many people you invite to take part in this. Um, so, so you do definitely need, need an experienced deliverer. And again, time zones can be a bit of a problem. So when people log in, that's what they see. They see the educator there. We usually do a PowerPoint presentation, and you can see who's engaging. And they've got a little free text box here, so they can write in and say, could this be ichthyosis or something? And so, so you can kind of answer that as you go along, and, and it works. I'm not going to spend much time on this other than to say that these, these are the sort of blended bits that we do in the UK. The, the favourite bit of the students, the least favourite bit for the educators because they're jolly hard work to organise them and, and they're expensive to run. Um, but interestingly, the overseas lots still do as well in the exam, so they probably don't make much difference to the actual educational package. Um, how much does this thing cost to run? Well, uh, that, these are our figures from last year. So we didn't actually spend much in the kind of R&D last year because we kind of done them that the year before. But most of the expenses, as has previously been the case, is, is the human cost in here. But it's quite a profitable thing for, for the organisation. So, so, you know, it, it's a, it's, this type of education is becoming quite popular. Um, and that's the, just an example of the revenue that we're doing. Does it work? Um, the key question. <laughs> So we get good exam results from our students, which suggests that they've learnt something, and we've also done some studies looking at their testing them before and after the diploma, and I'm delighted to say they've done better at the end. So that's always good. Um, and there, there's personal practice. A lot of them go to become GPs with special interests, and we've demonstrated that there's an improvement in their clinical practice, lesion recognition and confidence in managing patients at the end of the diploma. And I think this is a really important area here, is that... We, we, we're going to be hoping to work with the BAD about this to upskill other allied health professionals to try and widen the net of dermatology provision in the UK through this kind of platform. And, and I think it's you know, definitely got relevance and, and would key very much into the, the King's Fund. So, so that's basically what we're doing. And none of this would be possible without my wonderful 
team of colleagues and other consultant dermatologists and administrators. And, uh, and it's been a, a huge load of fun and hopefully will carry on to be so. So thank you very much. <laughs>